Hey everybody and welcome to the channel The Whiteboard Doctor. Today we're going to be talking about class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs. These are the calcium channel blockers. So this will be the last video in our series on antiarrhythmic drugs. Let me put channel here. Um, for those of you who have been following along, we did an introduction to antiarrhythmic drugs and then we did a video on class 1 sodium channel blockers, class 2 um, beta blockers, class 3 potassium channel blockers, and finally class 4 calcium channel blockers. We will link all those videos in this video's description. If you want to follow them in order, it might make more intuitive sense. If you're just looking for a discussion excuse me, on class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs, that is what we'll talk about today. So class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs, we'll get back into these uh, depolarization action potential graphs here in a second, but calcium channel blockers um, essentially block L-type calcium channels. Ooh, I don't know why that got all fuzzy. L-type calcium channels. All right, what does that mean exactly? Well, these channels can be found actually on vascular smooth muscle, smooth muscle, SM, M. They can be found on cardiac myocytes, and they actually can also be found on cardiac nodal tissue. So there's multiple areas in which these calcium channel blockers can work, all right? In terms of their, you know, specific mechanism, it regulates the influx of calcium into these cells, all right? So the channels, the L-type channels, um, as you can imagine, regulate the influx of calcium into these various cells, and thus cause changes to those cells. Specifically for the action potential, um, we need to kind of talk about the nodal tissue and the myocytes. So calcium channel blockers, with kind of this uh, thought in mind, right, uh, affect both cardiac myocytes as well as cardiac nodal tissue. And the action potential that you see with nodal tissue and myocytes are, di are different. And I think it's worth discussing. So what we'll do here is we'll first talk about the nodal tissue. When the nodal tissue starts to depolarize, you get this sodium influx. And that's what you see here. So sodium goes in. After that, though, you actually get a calcium influx from those L-type calcium channels. All right. And this is calcium in, specifically L-type. Oop, let me mute my computer here. Then after that, you will get the efflux of potassium. So potassium out, leading back down to, you know, the more negative sitting potential of the nodal tissue. Okay, so keep that in mind, and we'll come back to kind of that uh, effect of blocking this calcium channel. Now we go to the myocyte. The myocyte is a little more complex. So you can think of it kind of as sodium is going in here. So sodium in. At the same time, though, there's some calcium going in as well. Here, you start to get potassium out the sodium channels start to close, but you still are getting some calcium in for a period, and then that stops, and that is when uh, repolarization finishes. So you start to get some calcium in, you still have calcium coming in, calcium coming in, and then it stops. Potassium is going out, and potassium keeps going out, and that's repolarization, right? Because you start at negative, you know, let's say about 90 millivolts, and you're starting to get less negative and more positive as sodium and calcium are flowing in, then potassium starts flowing out, and you start to get more negative again. Same thing here. You start negative, and you're going more towards positive. These are L-type calcium channels as well. So in terms of one of the mechanisms, the calcium channel blockade, you are going to slow down the nodal tissue, right, 
and thus decrease the amount of you know action potentials that are shot down into the heart because those nodes if we will let we'll just draw a heart down here quick so we have atrium atrium our ventricles we have right the sa node up here the av node here down into the bundle of his perkinji's bundle branches and the action potential comes through the sa node through the atriums into the AV node down and then into the myocardium of the ventricles. So these calcium channel blockers are slowing the nodal tissue and also they're decreasing the slope of this myocyte and decreasing the velocity of the action potential. So they're also decreasing action potential velocity. All right, so they affect both the nodal tissue and the kind of cardiac myocytes themselves. And that, you know, will affect phase zero of the cardiac myocyte, which, you know, we know is this phase here. And the slope that occurs with this initial depolarization. Now, if we go back over we see that we had cardiac myocytes we talked about, cardiac nodal tissue we talked about. This third thing here, though, is vascular smooth muscle. So we actually also get smooth muscle relaxation. So if we look at an artery, let's say this is the artery, the artery is actually kind of wrapped in all this smooth muscle. And the smooth muscle either relaxes and causes vasodilation, or it can contract and cause vasocontraction. Well, with calcium channel blockers, they affect smooth muscle and can lead to vasodilation of the blood vessels. All right, so things that we can kind of summarize for their activity as a class in general is one, they can cause vasodilation through the relaxation of smooth muscles. Two, they can decrease contractility, right? Three, they can decrease heart rate through that nodal tissue. And then four, they can decrease conduction velocity. All right. Now, all calcium channel blockers are not created equal. All right, and that's what we'll kind of discuss at the end here. So we have two different kinds of calcium channel blockers. We have, just like beta blockers, cardioselective, and we have non-cardioselective. All right, and when we talk about these two different kind of subclasses of calcium channel blockers, um, they have somewhat different functionality and then different applications as well. So these cardioselective beta blockers are also termed non-dihydropyridines, which then you can imagine non-cardioselective beta blockers are known as dihydropyridines which is nice and confusing. So the nons and the dihydros are opposite. So cardioselective is non-dihydropyridine, whereas non-cardioselective is dihydropyridine. I don't know if that's helpful. That's was helped me remember back when I was in medical school, um, that non goes with, you know, not non, they're opposites in terms of their titles. The, the cardioselective non-dihydropyridines um, are verapamil, and diltiazam. And as cardioselective, they are great anti-anginals. So they're great for patients with angina, which is you get chest pain from, you know, not enough blood flow from stenosis of the coronary arteries and little clots. But with that being said, they can cause, which makes sense, Things like bradycardia, right, because they slow the nodal tissue down. AV nodal blocks, 
right, by really inhibiting and slowing down those nodes, and depressed contractility of the heart, which can be really bad in someone with, like, uh, let's say, decompensated heart failure. So you need to be really careful because they have a, you know, um, tough adverse effect profile that you need to monitor for. Non-cardioselective beta blockers, also known as dihydropyridine, uh, pyridines are things like amlodipine, common name is Norvasc, philodipine, isratipine, which can be put down an NG tube, nicardipine, um, and then nifedipine, also known as procardia. These are all um, dihydropyridines or non-cardioselective, also nemotipine and natrendipine, but I didn't include those. As such, these are often used for things like hypertension. So they're great antihypertensives. Their side effect profile is different from the side effect profile of non-dihydropyridines. Um, primarily, you'll get things like flushing, Headache, Ooh, headache, swelling in the legs or edema. That's a big one. Someone comes in with bilateral low extremity edema. You can get tachycardia and obviously hypotension or low blood pressure. All right. Um, one thing I should include it over here that I failed to mention is in addition to antianginals, they're often used for kind of atrial tachycardias, AFib, a a fib, a flutter. All right. So like fib and flutter. So those are class four calcium channel blockers. I hope that is helpful. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Um, feel free to subscribe and follow along if you feel inclined. Check out some of our other anti-arrhythmic videos. Um, let us know what you think. Stay well, and we'll see you all next time.